Welcome to Communist of America podcast. And this week we're going to talk about the obvious thing about the headline, what's in the news right now, which is uh, the assassination attempt on Donald Trump. This is the first time something like this has happened in over 40 years. And 2024 is not the same as 1981. It's a different world. The degree of polarization is far more intense. The impact that this is going to have on U.S. society in the coming months leading up to the election and in the coming years. I mean, this is a huge history making event that we just watched. So, yeah, yeah, this is big. That's right. And, you know, we were actually going to try to take this week off for the podcast. The reason being that next week we have the founding Congress of the Revolutionary Communists of America. So we're getting ready for that. We have over 400 people registered uh, for the founding conference of this new political party in the U.S., Uh, So, yeah, we were thinking of taking this week off, but, uh, you know, I think uh, Alan Woods often says that if you wanted to live an uh, uh, easy, quiet, tranquil life, then you pick the wrong time to be born. Uh, And as communists, this is, uh, like uh, Antonio said, this is a huge event. Uh, And it comes on top of, you know, event after event. We already uh, went into the 2024 election campaign knowing this was going to be a very interesting election. Uh, It it was going to be a repeat of the two most hated candidates uh, in living uh, memory, uh, Donald Trump uh, against Joe Biden in the context of inflation, the economic crisis, the war in Ukraine, the slaughter in Gaza. So we knew it was going to be uh, a very, very polarized moment. And uh, and, uh, and of course, two weeks ago, we saw the debate debacle uh, with, uh, that really threw the Democratic Party and the ruling class into a panic. They were calling it a, a, a DEFCON moment uh, of just a total catastrophe where they're trying to scramble to find an alternative, try to push Biden out. So that was unprecedented. And we made a special podcast episode on that. And now two weeks later, boom, you have another uh, bombshell of an event uh, that is, uh, is is driving things even to the to the to the next level. So maybe we can start by describing uh, the the events. What happened? I mean, I think most people probably saw the videos and have read about it. But right, a few minutes into one of Trump's stump speeches in Pennsylvania, he's speaking about immigration, and suddenly bullets start to fly. You can see he has a quick reaction, uh, feeling his ear, and then he ducks down as more. A volley of gunfire hits the crowd and people are screaming. And it was pretty surreal to watch the the footage. It's the kind of stuff that up till now you've seen on like in the world of Hollywood. You've seen it like in the Civil War movie by A24, this type of event. Well, now it's reality. And I think a lot of people aren't exactly surprised that something like this is happening because there's been a sense that this polarization is intensifying, that, you know, we are moving more and more in the direction of of political violence because these contradictions are are uh, are just becoming so so intense and so unbearable. There's a lot of anger. There's an explosive anger in society. The question for us as communists is how is that anger being channeled? Who's tapping into it? Who's speaking to it? And who's trying to ignore it, you know, and Anyway, we have, I guess we can get into all of this, but this is kind of the world that we've been living in, in part since 2016, I would say, since the 2016 election first brought uh, Trumpism into the world, but also the Sanders phenomenon. You know, they had this general rejection of of uh, the liberal center, of the status quo, of all the establishment politicians. Sanders capitulated to Hillary Clinton in 2016 and then to Biden in 2020. So that route on the left was totally closed. Trump, on the other hand, came out fighting and didn't capitulate and has stood up to everything that the system has thrown at him. And so you have this distorted situation where all of that class anger, much of it very healthy anger on social working class demands is finding no expression except for the reactionary expression that Trump is giving it saying he's the one that's going to fight against all the moneyed interests and the elite and the Washington establishment and drain the swamp. Well, we had four years of that. The swamp did not get drained. The The elites were just fine, actually better than ever. And he's about to get back in uh, to power again. So that there's a problem of this political vacuum in the US where you have this fighting language from the right and you don't have the fighting language from the left. There's no one responding with an ideological backbone saying you're right to be angry your right to to have this the sense of rejection towards the media and the establishment and 
all the politicians of the ruling class, we should be fighting against it. No one's no one's uh, voicing that, which is exactly the role that the communists have to step into that space. You have this situation where Donald Trump is cynically tapping into that anger. He himself is a millionaire, a Manhattan elite, uh, what one could say. And yet he's the only one that's giving expression to that rage that people feel. Uh, and in fact, you could see that um, Trump was very smart in the moment. He, after a few seconds where uh, his supporters were just watching in the background, screaming, trying to figure out what's happening. And then Trump stood up and he pushed the the uh, security services aside and he raised his fist uh, defiantly, uh, you know, basically making a, making a show and, and saying, and he said, fight, fight, you know, and he's, and, and everyone just cheered. And you can see how just like that, I mean, that's gonna, that photo, it's very iconic. I'm sure people have seen it. Uh, and a lot of people are saying that just won him the election. So he took advantage of that. He, he presented himself as being a fighter against the status quo, against the establishment. He's making it seem like the establishment is wanting to drive him out, which is partially true uh, or very true. But then, uh, you know, it, it's led to this uh, to this current situation where a lot of people are actually uh, coming up with all kinds of theories like, uh, you know, is this are, are the liberals, is this quote unquote elite, is the left trying to get rid of Trump and basically take him out altogether. Right. There's all there's a flood of conspiracy theories that are, you know, flooding the internet right now. And it's not surprising that that's happening. This is the first presidential election, sorry, the first presidential assassination attempt to ever happen on live TV and in the era of social media. But it's also this environment of extreme polarization. And that underlying that is mistrust against all the media, against the politicians. Half the country hates Trump. The other half hates the liberal media and everything else. I mean, you have this sort of, uh, yeah, partisan division that's taking place in society. So nobody trusts anything. And you have millions of people that are also making light of it and joking about it. And there's memes flying around. I wouldn't give, uh, I wouldn't indulge in speculation about any of the conspiracy theories. To me, it's not necessary and it's beside the point. The polarization is very real the the uh, verge of violent division in the United States is very real. And this is a result of bourgeois politics reaching an impasse. They are the ones responsible for political violence in general. Um, when the right wing points the finger at Biden, at the liberals, at the whole media apparatus, which is largely conducting the systematic fear mongering campaign saying Trump is the personification of the threat to democracy, the worst thing that could happen to the United States. It's This is the language of lesser evilism, basically saying you need to vote Biden for four more years because whatever you're going to get with Trump is going to be worse. Luckily, millions of people in, you know, there's been an advance in class consciousness. Millions of people reject lesser evilism and they say, oh, genocide Joe is the alternative. I'm not interested in either of these. I reject them both. And so that's a, that's a step forward. But in the attempt to try and, you know, prop up uh, Biden and the Democrats against Trump, they've been using, they've been hammering this rhetoric about the danger that Trump represents. So in that sense, I mean, they have a point when they say that like sooner or later, this kind of rhetoric is going to push someone to say, okay, that's the next Hitler, then let's take him out. I mean, that's, they, they, they uh, you know, that, that is part of the picture. And the reason why this attack against Trump is having such a reactionary implication is, of course, this is increasing his chances of winning. It increases the sympathy that people feel for him. And in the eyes of his base, this confirms everything that they've believed that they've been told by Trump and, and others up till now. Basically, they felt gaslit by the liberals and the Democrats who say, oh, no, things aren't bad. Things are great. The economy is great. You should actually be feeling grateful for uh, for Biden and his presidency. Uh, and uh, and but they can see how the, the 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 ruling class as a whole has been at every strip trying to constrain Trump, try to get rid of him politically from the political arena. Uh, they've tried impeachment. They've tried using the the, the courts generally uh, against him. Um, and for a lot of people, I mean, the sentiment that you see out there is like, well, this was just the next step. That's the logical conclusion. You're saying he's a fascist and this and that. Well, if he's like Hitler, I guess the only thing that you can do then is is get rid of him. So they're blaming the left. They're blaming the Democrats. They're even blaming, quote unquote, communism, which they see that they identify the left with the Democrats, which is extremely reactionary. And it's basically solidified that Trump camp 
uh, even more uh, to, to, to back him and to, and to see him as some kind of uh, alternative against that establishment. Right. Yesterday, I was um, listening to as wide a variety of uh, podcasts, trying to read uh, coverage on like X and watching YouTube, things that had been coming out in response to the events um, in the in less than 24 hours that had passed. Um, trying to get a read on the Trump camp and how this has impacted that um, millions of people. And it's actually not hard to to understand the impact that it's had. Um, there's a lot of people that are expressing the same mood and it's very clear. It's like the Trump camp was already convinced that the 2020 election had been stolen from them, that all of the institutions were, you know, conspiring against their candidate and that Trump was fighting against all of all of these things. Like you said, for and this line has been repeated ad nauseum now. Oh, they tried to stop him in 2020. They tried to they stole the election from him. They tried to get him in the courts. They tried to silence him, sue him, uh, lock him up. And when none of that worked, now they're trying to assassinate him. Like we've seen this coming. A number of figures on the Trump camp have said that. The reactionary part, of course, is not only that this pushes people back into Trump's corner and says, like, obviously, he's fighting against this whole array of powers that are lined up against him. But it's that the class divisions of society are not being clarified by this event. They're being blurred. And what we want as communists is for the divide in society, for the, the context of this anger and this polarization to be sharpened on class lines, for people to realize the source of their anger, the source of their oppression. The reason that pe millions of people feel like they're slipping into misery is because of the capitalist system, because of the capitalist class. And the way to fight against it is through numbers, through workers coming together and using the one power that they have, the power to paralyze the economy, to use their leverage as the uh, indispensable, you know, the the class that makes everything run. There, there is no capitalism. There's no economy. There's no operation of anything in society without the permission of the working class. So that's the way you would actually put the, the working class at the center of a fight against capitalists. What's happening is that, um, you know, Trumpism is basically blurring that. And a lot of the Trump camp thinks now that their fight is against the so-called left, which they associate with Biden and the Democrats and the media. They look at the left as like some kind of defense of elites, some kind of defense of the Washington swamp. I mean, it's it's scandalous that Trump has succeeded in painting the left as Biden's camp of painting the left in general as like some defense of the establishment when really, as we've been saying, the communist, the, the real left, this backbone should have been a message of class war that's very clearly making its, its case against Biden, against the Democrats, as against the party of Wall Street, Democratic Socialists of America and all of these soft liberal lefts that have been gathering around Biden, jumping on the Democratic Party bandwagon, they have totally tarnished the, that's actually they are partly to blame for the way that this line of polarization has unfolded, because if the left had been taking a class war, a clear class independent position, and they'd have been speaking clearly to the class discontent, then it would have been much harder for Trump to conflate the left with Biden, with the party of Wall Street, with the capitalists. That's exactly what they've been doing. So that's the point is on the quote unquote left, they've been they've totally capitulated. They're, they're basically now just I mean, they're the you know, the squad, Bernie Sanders, uh, AOC, all these people are effectively just Democrats. They're uh, securing the Democratic Party votes from the left to be channeled to supporting this capitalist party. Uh, they've said things along the lines of, uh, uh, this is, I think Bernie Sanders said that uh, Biden has been the most effective president in modern history and that we need to back Biden. And this is as of like three days ago, by the way, he wrote a whole uh, um, opinion piece for the New York Times and he said that we need to vote for Biden to get Trump out. Uh, lesser evilism, classic. And then Ilhan Omar, she said that uh, she's definitely behind Biden because he's the best president of her life. That's genocide Joe they're talking about. And so they're, 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 they've totally capitulated. It's a disgrace, really, that uh, the word socialism, communism, the word left uh, is really attached to these people and therefore, uh, by default, attached to the Democratic Party. And so, as you said, I think we make it very clear the communists, we fight for the working class, 
We want to unite the working class against both of those parties, which, which are capitalist parties that defend the interests of capital that are totally opposed to those of, of the workers who are exploited and oppressed by this disgusting system that is capitalism. What we want is for the working class as a class to uh, really seize the, 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 the political machinery, get rid of all these institutions altogether, and to really take over the economy so that it can be democratically planned by the working class under a worker's government to provide uh, a good life for everybody because the wealth is there for it. And so if you think about the effect of this shooting, it's not helping the development of class consciousness. And this is also why generally communists are against uh, individual terrorism as a tactic. Communists are not uh, terrorists, quote unquote. What we want is a mass united working class movement and individual terrorism does not uh, serve to foment that. Right. It actually, it's counterproductive. It's detrimental to the development of class consciousness for a number of reasons. For one, it makes the working class, it relegates the working class to the position of bystanders. They're passive, they're helpless, they're thrown into panic, they feel endangered. It throws a sense of chaos and fear into society. Those are not things that prepare the way for a combative class struggle where workers come together and prepare to fight the capitalists. On the contrary, it's like you're, you're substituting a small minority that's carrying out an act of violence against maybe against Trump or against a ruling class politician. But it doesn't do anything to show the workers that they have the power to transform society or to build their confidence in their collective strengths. That's the difference between uh, a communist tactic, a communist uh, class independent strategy, is that everything you should be doing, the, the litmus test of any uh, tactic from our perspective in terms of the rules of the class war, if it builds the confidence of the working class, if it makes them more conscious of their interests, if it unifies workers, these are things that can help the class struggle to develop onto a higher level. If you're acting behind the backs of the working class, if you're explain if you're this is something that the the dsa and the democratic socialists that have run through the democratic party they've basically said elect us and we will pass this or that reform and then things will get better it's, it's a ruling class party it doesn't do anything to show the workers that the party of joe biden the party of wall street is not something that we can trust it's not something that we can use it actually foments illusions to that effect and of course it blurs the lines between those who should be fighting a class war who should be you know, the champions of clarifying class independence. And it's putting them into this dirty camp with the party of Biden and the ruling class. When right wing workers look at that and they say AOC is propping up Biden, that's typical. That's what the socialists are doing. They're propping up the Democrats and they want more taxes. And it just totally blurs the class lines and it doesn't do anything to help workers realize we have our own interests separate from the interests of any Democratic politician, any Republican politician. We have our own interests against the interests of the bosses, against the entire capitalist class, that the entire media apparatus, the entire political apparatus, all the institutions, the Supreme Court, the Congress, the Senate, all of those are tools in the hands of the capitalists. Our interests are to sweep these things aside. We have our own interests we want to fight for. That's the way we want to develop class consciousness. And so, and so in a similar way, basically, individual terrorism puts the onus on an individual that's going to act on behalf of a section of the population, whether it be the workers or, or others. Uh, similarly, if you promise workers that, oh, vote for me and I'll change and I'll change things for passing reform, it basically it shows these are all methods that uh, are not communist methods because they don't put the task on the working class as a class itself to transform uh, society. The other side, too, is if people think that getting rid of one single figure, one single politician or one single capitalist will somehow fix the system, I think that shows people not understanding uh, why the system is, is why, why, why things are going badly. Let, let's just put it that way, right? It's not, the polarization is not caused by Trump. He might help it, right? But really, Trump himself is a product of a capitalist system in decline. Uh, we've explained all of this uh, earlier. And getting rid of uh, having illusions that you just change one person and you, and you fix everything. I mean, really, it's naivete and it's not telling the truth to, to the workers. Uh, and on the contrary, as we've seen, it actually produces a more reactionary situation where uh, it creates confusion. Point being, it does nothing to clarify the main points that we want to make as communists, which is to highlight the fundamental dividing line in society is class. 
uh, is uh, the working class against the ruling class. And this is done the opposite of, of clarifying that. Yeah, I think it's important to lay out a perspective for what happens next now. Trump is at the RNC today. That's going down. And obviously his odds are better than ever. I mean, the last couple of weeks was already a gift to Trump. And now you have this. I mean, it's the the sympathy of a large layer of intermediate wavering uh, voters in the swing states it does seem to be tipping towards Trump. His polling is probably stronger than ever. Biden has been just wallowing in his crisis and doing all these interviews to try to prove that he's got he's got yeah, what it takes. <laughs> just su- keeps getting worse and worse every time. Surprise press conferences <laughs> to try and impress. It's not really working. It's all backfiring. So. It looks as if, you know, the fate of uh, the November election is getting locked in. And so for a lot of people, that must be a scary prospect. I think that's the because of the attitude that's being projected in the media and again on this on by the soft left. And I think what we need to realize is that the coming period, the prospect of a Trump 2.0 presidency is not going to be one of fascism. It's not going to be a police state. It's not going to be a dictatorship. The Trump apparatus is not going to be strong enough to come down and carry out massive repression. If they try, the reality is they're going to have another 2020 type of social explosion on their hands. And actually, a lot of the uh, far sighted elements of the ruling class, they can see this. Here's one thing. I'm not sure if we would uh, regularly call Brett Stevens of The New York Times a far sighted element of the ruling class. He's kind of a traditional bourgeois conservative. But he, on this particular case, he wrote this article uh, on Saturday just before the shooting. It says Republicans will regret a second Trump term. Um, he's talking about now is the summer of Republican content because everything seems to be going well for the GOP. And he says, in short, they have good reason to think that they're going to get back in the White House next January. Only then will the regrets set in. And he starts to lay out reasons why. They shouldn't be celebrating so soon because the reality is that a Trump 2.0, let me put it in his terms. First, Trump won't slay the left. Instead, he will re-energize and radicalize it. I think that's first of all, we should we should start with that right there. He he goes on later to to recall the George Floyd uh, movement. Remember, there was 26 million people in the streets and there's no political force that has captured that sentiment that, you know, at the height of it in June 2020, 56, 54, a majority of the population thought that those protests were justified, thought that the burning of the police precinct was justified. Both Biden and Trump have denounced that. And there's no place in the political landscape where that is becoming a focal point where that's getting getting recognized. So what I'm saying is that's an element in society that's just beneath the surface that could come back out. Trump 2.0 is likely to bring that back out. And so what he was saying is, imagine the following scenario. This actually gets quite imaginative and quite vivid. He's saying Trump is in the White House and decides to make good on a signature promise of mass deportation of migrants. Federal agents are deployed to towns and cities to do the job, but many of them flatly refuse to participate in what feels to them like a modern day reenactment of the Fugitive Slave Act. They're joined by Democratic mayors and hundreds of thousands of Americans who are willing to form human chains around homes and neighborhoods to keep the agents out. But Trump doesn't back down and governors in red states call out the National Guard to break through the protests. Many are hurt. Some are killed. Riots ensue. That's the incendiary America we're likely to get again in a second Trump term. This is the perspectives from a ruling class uh, perspective saying, don't forget that Trump represents a danger because he can provoke a response from the masses. And I think the far-sighted elements of the ruling class, they know that the real danger for them, the reason they were wanting to uh, shut down the Bernie Sanders phenomenon wasn't because of Sanders. It's because of the millions behind him. It's that class discontent that they didn't want coming forward and becoming a force. Trump could unleash that. And that's really the danger for them. For us, we should be understanding that there has never been a better, more favorable time for revolutionary agitation, for revolutionary class independent ideas. The ideas of communists, they resonate now more than ever. And it's really a matter of how boldly, how widely can we spread them? We need to bring them systematically, carry these ideas into society. 
And to be clear, in, in content, not just in form, like a lot of a lot of uh, the main, probably workers that support Trump right now do not have a favorable view of communism and think that, quote unquote, communists are somehow responsible for what's going on with with Trump's shooting. But again, because they think that communism is the Democratic Party and the left elites and whatever. And so in content. If there was a massive campaign of agitation, if all of the if all of the forces of, of the communist generation were united, organized under a single party and a banner and putting forward a consistent message to explain what communism actually represents uh, in terms of fighting for workers' rights, for higher wages, fighting against the capitalists and the billionaires, fighting for uh, union rights, uh, fighting for free quality health care and explain we stand against both capitalist parties, etc., etc. I think that would break down a lot of that propaganda. A lot of these workers are duped by Trump's rhetoric and we can point out how the uh, immigrant workers are not to blame. Maybe workers that these people work with every day if they work on a construction site or uh, in other things, you know, uh, and explain how it's actually the, the billionaires that are benefiting off of exploiting and oppressing all of these uh, workers in society. Anyway, that is absolutely possible if it were done in a systematic way by a large uh, communist force in society. That's uh, th what we're building right now. We're building the nucleus of a mass communist party in the revolutionary communists uh, of America. Uh, I do want to point out, though, one, one thing that we should comment on is the response from all of the media, the response from all camps right now in, in the liberal press and also the conservative press, all of them are just, we condemn violence, political violence has no place in this country, this is not what America is, this is not what American values represent, we all need to unite. And it's like the hypocrisy is disgusting. Yeah, this is the most violent regime on the face of the planet. U.S. imperialism is the bloodiest force, the bloodiest state. I mean, look at what it's doing in Gaza. Actually, by some measures, The Lancet just reported, uh, I think last week, that if you, if you are to account for all the people buried under the rubble in Gaza right now and the people who are dying because of malnutrition or because they're bombing hospitals and shutting down the medical supply, all of those things factored in, the death count is more likely 186,000 people who have been killed. You have an entire young generation of Ukrainians that has been sent into a meat grinder because U.S. imperialism thought we can't pass up this opportunity to weaken Russia. This is a nice, convenient war. Go ahead, Ukraine. You go in. And, you know, playing this game about Ukraine's affiliation to NATO. You know, this is, this is, it doesn't matter how many people were going to die. It's, we're, they're going to fight until the last Ukrainian, until the last drop of blood. That's what Biden's willing to do. So, yeah, you have violence all around the world, violence of so many parts of the world where people are sinking into miserable conditions trying to escape those conditions, trying to find a way to feed their families, some of them emigrating, some of them moving to the United States and trying to see if they can survive. And then the Republicans and the Democrats both come down and scapegoat them and try and channel the, the, the hatred and the xenophobia towards these saying, that's your enemy. That's who's taking your job. That's who's underfunding your school. That's who's making your life harder and harder. This is the, the violence of the entire system. I mean, this whole the, the Trump campaign of this anti-immigrant push, by the way, what kind of violence was that preparing? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. and if we start, I He's mean, calling them animals. They're saying they're not humans. I mean, it's, yeah. it's the, the whole. And by the way, I mean, speaking of hypocrisy for the for, for the Trump campaign now to be saying that the, the left, i.e. Biden and the Democrats are to blame for the polarization and for the shooting because of their rhetoric when Trump in all of his uh, campaigns and the and the meetings that he's been doing he said things like um, that he he was calling on his supporters to knock the crap knock the crap out of counter protesters at his rallies in 2020 when you had the black lives matter movement he was tweeting that when the looting starts the shooting starts i.e encouraging right-wing vigilantes to go and shoot people which did indeed happen right so I mean, it's really rich for them to be saying this. Uh, and it, it, the, the violence of the, 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 the political violence and violence across the board is caused by capitalism itself uh, and, uh, and by, by the ruling class and by a system that's a dog eat dog uh, imperialist uh, hellscape, you know? Capitalism breeds violence and American capitalism in particular breeds political violence. There was a, a point that a comrade pointed out that since Lincoln... It's like 13% of the presidents since Lincoln have been assassinated. 
So it's not really that out of the ordinary that you have this expression of political violence. This is a violent country. This is the, the violence comes from the ruling class setting the tone, setting the morals in the way that they rule, in the way they govern, setting a model for what is normal. They, it's not that they're against violence. They just don't want the violence to be used against them as a class. And so what kind of violence have they used every time the workers have attempted to, to strike, to build the unions, to defend their rights? All kinds of horrific violence in the whole history of the labor movement. For, I mean, the labor movement for the vast majority of its history was made, it was illegal and was used as an excuse by the capitalists to, to set up prison camps, to deploy uh, armed thugs to kill workers that were striking. I mean, the, the class war and much of its history was actually was a literal mm -hmm. war in the United States. Now, to speak of the foundations of the, the, the founding of America itself, uh, what that was, it was a, a bloodbath uh, against the native population uh, in this continent uh, and uh, the, the legacy of, of slavery, of, of racism, uh, all of this, the, the imperialism in Latin America that you refer to. I mean, th this is what America represents. Yeah, the so-called the, the sacred constitution and, you know, the, the Supreme Court is supposedly a, an impartial body for interpreting the constitution according to the will of the founding father. That body defended Jim Crow segregation for generations, for like 90 years. That body was also defending slavery. I mean, th there was nothing. Uh, yeah, th th this is oppression and bloody exploitation has been some an element of American capitalism from its very beginning. So I think when they talk about violence, when the ruling class lectures the public about violence and gives us these moralizing speeches, we have to throw it back in their face and say the ruling class, the American ruling class is the source of the most violence that we're seeing today i mean as a species on this planet it's american imperialism this wounded animal that is going around the world trying to claw back its position of domination that's been slipping away from it for gen for for generations for decades um, and in their desperate attempt they're provoking wars they're destabilizing things they're making life a living hell i think it, this is the the perspective that we need to counter them with it, the, the working class is the only force in society that can put a stop to this kind of violence, this horrific, uh, you know, hell mm -hmm. that millions are living in. And I think the point of it is not to have like a negative uh, outlook, like, well, there's violence everywhere. The, be pessimistic. The world's going to shit and there's we're powerless to do anything about it. The whole point is the ruling class's desperation where they talk about the instability, the polarization. They're they're losing the grip on their own democratic institutions. Uh, the whole point is that opens up a massive space for another force in society to enter the scene and to take matters into our own hands, which is, again, the organized working class, if it were given an outlet, if uh, if there was a, a left force big enough uh, that could speak to that class and point out the exit, that we don't have to live uh, in these conditions, that another world is possible absolutely um and uh and yet right now there isn't such a voice i mean we're we're saying it uh certainly in our podcast and uh and through all our material our, our, our agitation our comrades are, are are talking about it and they're recruiting they're building communist cells we're we're putting forward this optimistic message that this polarization it's uh it's uh, the inevitable product of capitalism in decline that is a fact uh, and we have to see what's progressive about it, which is that that anger can be channeled into a force to transform things for the better. Yeah, it is progressive that millions of people are casting away their illusions in bourgeois democracy and the institutions. It's, it's a good thing, actually, that people no longer believe that the system can deliver them a future because that's what opens them up to a revolutionary perspective. And that's happening very rapidly. Look, part of being a communist is looking is living under capitalism, living under the rule of this class and being able to see that there's nothing eternal or natural about that rule. There's nothing eternal or natural about this capitalist structure of society. Humans can live in a different way. And the working class has the potential to become the force that dominates society, the, the force that plans it in a harmonious way, according to basic human uh, needs, according to the interests of flourishing human culture and freedom and you know, human happiness. I mean, there's no reason that we have to live in this society dominated by the interests of arbitrary capital, of this unthinking market, the profit motive. That's, I mean, it, ultimately, our struggle against the ruling class is a struggle against a political force that represents this blind, unthinking, uh, you know, forces of, of the market, of, of capital.
So, you know, the, the struggle for communism is actually the struggle for conscious human administration of this wonderful productive forces that humanity has at its disposal. There's no reason for people to go hungry, to be living for half a million people in this, the richest country on earth to be living in the streets for people to go bankrupt because they get sick. I mean, we have all of this potential. Being a communist means seeing that potential, seeing it, little glimpses of it every single day and seeing that there are a lot of people that if you get to talking to them, if we can communicate this systematically, there is a vast uh, audience for communist ideas in the 2020s in the United States who are open to these ideas, who would respond to an invitation to get organized and to become a, a systematic force for revolution if we can communicate that very clearly, which we're building the kind of force that, uh, that can. Absolutely. And on that note, next weekend on July 27th and 28th, we are holding the founding Congress of the Revolutionary Communists of America, a new political party that aims to unite uh, all, all this new communist generation, given an organized expression so that we can carry out that message systematically into every neighborhood, every workplace, every campus, uh, and to actually build the alternative to these two rotten options of the Democrats and, and Republicans, one that can actually fight for working class interests uh, and fight to tear down the entire system and build a new society, a communist society. Uh, so all of our uh, viewers or listeners, you are welcome to attend this Congress. Uh, there's a link in the description. You can apply to join and uh, uh, check if you want to uh, attend the Congress. Please, uh, there's a, there's a, in the form you can select so and a comrade in your area will reach out to discuss how you can get involved with the RCA.